Well, this is Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I'm Jim Grant, and welcome to our podcast. Joining me this morning is always the great deputy editor of Grant's, Evan Lorenz, and also um, our special guest, Tony Canale, comma, JD. Tony is the, uh, is the head of global research, or the global head of research at, uh, at Covenant Review, of, of which, about which, and about whom more presently. But uh, Evan, you're, you're calling in from Brooklyn, are you not? The borough of Brooklyn? Yeah, the great borough. Yeah. So I commuted from Brooklyn to Manhattan this morning. And on this commute, I saw something that I've never seen before. I've ridden the subways, man and boy, for more than 70 years. And this, I got in the train this morning at Clark Street, one stop from Brooklyn. And you, and I, I something, it's, it smelled like, you know, it's, it smelled like a bar in New York before Mayor Bloomberg stopped smoking in bars. Kind of nostalgic. But this was a subway car, like the two train. So I looked down the car, and there is a, it's a guy sitting there smoking a cigarette. I, I haven't seen, I, I didn't even see this during the years of the Korean War, for Pete's sake. <laughs> I didn't see it when the Dodgers won the World Series in 1955. I didn't see this in any of the seven decades of subway ridings, the first. And I think, Evan, this might speak a little bit to the, um, the downgrade of the city of New York by Fitch just the other day. I mean, not exactly. I don't think they had in mind this dude who was smoking a cigarette in the two train. But maybe uh, they Fitch also rated, commuted. Yeah, maybe Fitch uh, had. Anyway, Fitch cut uh, ratings on 38 billion of city GO bonds, uh, one notch to double A minus from double A. That's the fourth highest uh, credit ranking. Yeah, even that seems a little bit aggressive to me, or a little bit uh, charitable, given the fiscal state of things. But my goodness, I talk about a broken window. Anyway, that will conclude the local color. But it was, uh, to me, an astounding thing, a little bit uh, perplexing and not a little discouraging. However, I am here also to announce another discovery. I'm full of discoveries. Uh, Evan and and Tony, I have uh, chanced upon something in the last couple of days that I wish I'd known about for the past couple of years, which is an email thing that you get delivered to your inbox, if you like. It's called Delancey Place. Delancey Place, one word. And um, it delivers you about 400 or 500 words of excerpt from a book. As simple as that. If you're an insomniac, and some of us on this call seem to be insomniacs, I'm, yeah, I'm raising my hand, but you wake up bright and early, and what you find is, for example, an excerpt this morning from The Man Who Saved Britain. I gather this is a, a life of uh, Ian Fleming, who lived a, a quite uh, dashing life in espionage and uh, national security before he turned to authorship of the Bond series. But here was a uh, excerpt from the life of um, Ian Fleming about uh, his first novel, first Bond novel, Casino Royale. Fascinating. So this is, I mean, this, these are like little droplets of, um, of honey in this not so scintillating year. But you chance across these things, I, I think I've mentioned before, spaceweather.com. You can find out how many asteroids are, are menacing planet Earth, all sorts of stuff on the web. Somebody asked me the other day, is this a good time to be a polymath, meaning you know, of course, someone who has mastered more than one topic. So I don't know about that, I said, but it's a great time to be a dilettante. I mean, your phone is the bridge to dilettantism. Anybody can be a dilettante. <laughs> Just power up the phone. All right, that's uh, enough prelude. So Tony Canale is, a, is, a, uh, is an alumnus of uh, Columbia University. He went to law school in Texas, University of Texas, and he graduated with distinction from there. And he went on to join this and that distinguished law firm, was a general counsel here and there, and finally got into the business of uh, analysis, of financial analysis of a certain specific kind with a publication called Covenant Review. That was in 1907. So Covenant Review, a little bit like Delancey Place, has been around longer than you think. But uh, Tony, welcome. Thanks so much, Jim. It's great to be with you guys. Well, it is great to have you here. And I'm, um, you know, Evan Lorenz arranged this, and I'm going to let him ask the first question, but I want to uh, continue to monopolize what is not, after all, be a monopoly, uh, be a monologue, but I want to invite Evan to begin the interrogation of our guest with one excerpt uh, from an issue of Grants. This was something we published a couple of years ago, and it was about uh, the doormats of Wall Street, which we identified as the buyers of corporate debt. Because, you know, it's, it, it, you know, um, if you're a, the creditor of a corporation, kind of everyone's out to get you, right? The Fed is out to uh, inflate the currency in which your loan is denominated. The management of the company is uh, is incentivized to do what it does, not by improved debt ratings, but by a higher share price, right? So um, everywhere you turn, you're kind of a victim. So we wound up this uh, piece with the following sentence. We said, 
Creditors are the loneliest corporate stakeholders. Management disdains them and the Fed debases them. But give them this much, at least it's kind of a virtue. Anyway, they never complain. Ah, oh, sad, but uh, Evan, this has annoyed both of us. Would you please ask Tony what he is making of this uh, particular, or the atmospherics in credit? They seem to be uh, confoundingly anti-creditor. Yeah, so just the other day, um, S&P uh, put out a projection that the 12-month default rate on high-yield bonds will reach 9% in September of 2021. So that's not trailing default, that's perspective defaults. That's a prediction, it could be wrong, but it's almost exactly twice the 4.5% yield on uh, in sub-investment grade bonds. And issues are able to, according to Covenant Review, issue debt with very little uh, creditor protection and higher turns of leverage in a very accommodating market. Uh, Tony, how do you square these facts and uh, how do you make sense of kind of where we are in this current moment in the market? It's a great question, Evan. And, you know, the honest truth is right now, the last covenant terms that we're seeing across both you know, bonds, high yield bonds and leveraged loans are a function of a hot market where there's still a lot of liquidity in the system and people are looking to rushing to put that liquidity to use. And there's a thirst for this paper and issuers and borrowers can point to a number of examples in the market where they say, look, these loose terms aren't just something I'm asking for. This is the market we're in. If you want to get these, you know, if you want to participate in this market and this asset class, this is part of the negotiation and this is part of what the market will bear. So unfortunately for creditors who are looking to, to deploy capital, this is one of the things that they have to deal with. And unfortunately, you only get a chance to really push back when an issuer or a borrower is challenged, and then you can extract some more restrictive terms. Hey, Tony, so uh, the, the very term covenant uh, is likely to mean different things to different people. And, you know, uh, uh, the uh, initial uh, Puritans arriving in the inhospitable wilds of New England in the 1620s and 30s believed they had a covenant with God, right? They, had, they believed that they had uh, contracted uh, with the Almighty to uh, found a nation on a hill. That's a religious term, and covenant also has many legal terms. What is covenant in the context of the bond market? Covenants are, in the context of a bond market, it are really just an agreement, a contract between the issuer or the borrower on the one hand, and the creditors on the other hand. And unfortunately for creditors, um, a lot of the language that's built into these are extremely issuer and borrower friendly. And a lot of times what the issuer or borrower is allowed to do under these contracts is a far cry from what the creditor expects they should be able to do. So when the rubber meets the road and an issuer really needs to do something aggressive or a borrower needs to do something aggressive under a credit agreement, the lender often finds out that to their detriment, oh, wow, they can do this. The language actually lets them do this. And courts are likely to respect that agreement as it's written. Their courts are going to say this is sophisticated language between sophisticated parties and we're not going to get involved. And so unfortunately, lenders really need to read the fine print. Uh, Tony, borrowers would say that Looser covenants give them the ability to navigate temporary downturns without incurring an event of default. And this year has been the ultimate temporary uh, problem where we shut down the economy in spring. So if you look back in 2020, would you say that loose documentation has been a drag on or a benefit to investors' performance this year? It's a great question. And honestly, the market has worked the way it should with respect to giving borrowers room to operate. So we saw when the market shut down in March uh, with the pandemic, a lot of lenders were willing to give borrowers forbearance under the credit agreements and give waivers of all kinds of restrictions in the credit agreement. That's the way the market's supposed to work. Borrowers are supposed to work collaboratively with their lenders <clears throat> when times become challenging. But to enter into a document that really is a carte blanche to do, give them carte blanche to do anything they want to do, uh, including things that are really hostile to lenders, I think it's a mistake. Again, that's what the market is bearing these days. And so borrowers can point to market conditions and say, we're not asking anything that's not out of the norm here. But Tony, it almost seems as if the lenders had uh, no competent legal representation uh, before they uh, agreed to close the transaction. I mean, how, how can they possibly be surprised at an outcome when uh, they have in front of them at the time of the signing of the documents all of the fine print? It's a good question, Jim, and I don't know the answer. I mean, the truth of the matter is lenders, not only all kinds of creditors, high yield creditors, leveraged loan creditors, not only do they have the fine print and access to sophisticated legal counsel, but there's a history of aggressive transactions in the marketplace that have been taken by aggressive companies, sometimes they're corporate sponsors, but there's a huge history in the marketplace and a backstory. So people shouldn't be surprised when 
an issuer or a borrower that needs to do something aggressive is willing to exploit these loopholes in the documents that are right there in plain sight. And that Tony, we've, when, we've been reporting yeah. on for years. This word aggressive, when does it elide into a more familiar colloquial expression like a uh, word like uh, sleazy? Um, <laughs> oftentimes, Jim, it's hard to draw a distinction between what's aggressive and what's sleazy. I mean, there are a number of transactions you can see out there where you would say, that's really sleazy. If I were to tell you that you're lending me $100 million on the basis of assets that I have in the credit that are going to, you're going to have recourse to if I default on a secured basis, and then the loophole language in the document says I can move some of those assets to a different entity that is remote from you and incur new debt that ahead of you there, you've got to look at that and say, that's really sleazy. But unfortunately, the documents often specifically provide that the issuer or borrower can do just that. And that's one of the problems is that investors, many investors yeah. don't expect to be taken advantage of in this way and don't realize they can be taken advantage of until it's too late. Yeah. It reminds me of a little bit of, a, of these face masks everyone's supposed to be wearing at all times. You know, these covenants would seem almost to be the something like a, like a guy walking down the street wearing a face mask uh, uh, slung under his chin, uh, the nose and mouth exposed. Aren't these covenants more or less like that? They have the appearance of serving a function, but uh, after all, in substance, they do nothing. I wouldn't go so far as to say they do nothing, Jim. There are meaningful restrictions that are there that, that issuers and borrowers still have to abide by. The problem is you're right in that they are so, you know, oftentimes so porous that they leave wide latitude for issuers and borrowers to structure around them. So the cynic would say, and, and unfortunately, the older I get, the more cynical I become, the cynic would say, these really are very covenants only in the loosest sense of the word, because you can do so much to obviate those protections and structure around. All right. Well, we'll, 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 we'll compromise. To, let's call them mesh face masks. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tony, so we've had a couple of changes in the last decade leading up to this kind of general loosening and kind of erosion of creditor protection. One has been kind of the rise of passive funds and uh, high yield, which don't read documents by definition. And the other is central banks pushing people more and more to search for yield in unconventional places and also taking more risk. Do you think what uh, the, the erosion in creditor protection has been more just buyers who don't ever read the documents? Or is it more that people have been pushed to take more risk in order to kind of generate the same yield they're accustomed to? I tend to think it's the latter. I think that there's been, especially with the rise of research services like Covenant Review and competitors of ours, I think that there's more of a presence in the market for people to be educated on what the terms say. And there's, these documents are more accessible to people than they were before. I think all of that being said, we're in a hot market and people are just pushing for yield and issuers and, and borrowers are, are looking to take advantage of that. And this is a widespread concern. It's not one issuer or borrower yeah. it's all over the yeah. place. Tony, let's, let's go into, into one particular gimmick or fandango uh, that seems to be back again. And this is is uh, something that Covenant Review has covered with, I think, uh, a quite appropriate level of indignation. I, I love the fact that Covenant Review, which one might suppose uh, would be a dry as dust recitation of legal arguments, is in fact takes a stand, has a moral point of view on these questions, and it is capable of quite well placed righteous indignation, as in uh, the phenomenon of no premium on default. So, what about no-fault defaults? Isn't this like crazy? First of all, can you explain what this is, how big it's become, and what the, what the risks are to people who invest for a living? It, it's a great question, Jim, and it is a, an outrageous provision. So to back up, high-yield instruments generally have a call provision in them that requires that if an issuer wants to exit the contract, the issuer can call them at the premium, whatever it is, the make-hold premium if you're before the call schedule or the call schedule if you're getting closer to maturity. And that's something that's bargained for between the issuer and the borrowers. Now, that call premium serves an important function. It's all it's there for if the issuer wants to refinance the bonds at a more attractive interest rate, right, right. they'll have to pay uh -huh. the, the, the call premium. And it's there if the covenants are too restrictive. So if the covenants are too restrictive and the issuer says, well, this is in the way of a transaction that I want to do, the issuer has a couple of options. It can either approach the borrower or the lenders and say, what do I have to pay you to get a consent to do this transaction? Or it can say, I'm calling in the bond. I'm removing these restrictions from my capital structure so that I can do the deal. Either way, the bondholders are being compensated. So that call premium function is an important part of the bargain between the lenders and the issuer. So the problem with no premium on default 
is this is a language that a couple of years ago was slipped into a deal. The first one to do it was Rackspace, where they basically said there shall be no premium payable upon an event of default. So this is a real problem because there's a lot of New York case law before this that said if an issuer defaults to get out of paying the premium, voluntarily defaults, that premium is still owed. This is case law going back to Sharon Steele in the 80s. Well, a recent case had said issuers and, and lenders can bar contract around that. And that's why you saw this language inserted into deals. So a lot of high-yield deals started including this language. It really was metastasizing. And what happened was Covenant Review uh, published a lot of articles bashing this provision and screaming about how it would destroy and erode covenant enforcement. And the buy side finally got together and said, we've had enough. We won't buy any deals if there's no premium on default. And it was largely eradicated. We didn't see it anymore until about within the last month, Rackspace, the original company that started it all, came to the market and included that language in there again. We only saw the preliminary terms. We haven't seen the final indenture yet, but I heard the deal was oversubscribed and it likely made it into the final terms. So it's a problem because this kind of language erodes the ability of the lenders to uh, extract value from the company if the company needs relief from its covenants. Wow. So this was something that creditors rebelled against a couple of years ago, and you said the latest deal was oversubscribed. Who exactly is buying these really deficient loan documents? I think it's the same people who say over and over again that they'll never buy another one of these deals, but then <laughs> they realize that they have to deploy capital. I hear it all the time. I'll never buy another one of these deals again. And then the deal is oversubscribed. So again, it just hammers home the point that covenant protection is just another element of the pricing decision. So, you know, whether it's the interest rate or whether it's the call schedule or whether it's, the, you know, the, the collateral asset set or whatever it is, this is just another element of that. And in a hot market, it gets eroded uh, really badly. Tony, you've been uh, watching and uh, transacting in these markets and, um, you know, standing up for uh, what appears to be uh, you know, equitable on and, uh, both sides of the bargaining table. Is Can you characterize the present moment in the covenant world as the loosiest, goosiest, and least creditor acceptable of your career? Or is it a runner-up to some other moment of extreme ease and uh, aggressiveness or sleaziness? An excellent question. I think that we have kind of slipped back to the worst of the worst. So by way of background, I think before the last five years, I would have said that the 2007 period, 2006, 2007, right before the crash, were the worst covenants. But I think in the last three years or so, three to four years, we've seen the worst covenants. You had a marginal improvement after the market shut down in March, where you had deals come back to the market. Everything was, you know, five-year papers, senior secured with some more restrictions on the ability to take value out of the credit. So those weren't the worst anymore. But then some of the more recent sponsor deals that have come across have been among the worst we've ever seen. In fact, there was one deal that came through that cleared that said that bondholders, no matter how many of the bonds they own, their voting power was capped at a certain threshold. This was the ancestry bond deal that came into the market. That is outrageous to say that even if you control a majority Majority of the bonds, beneficially own a majority of the bonds, your voting percentage is capped at the threshold. So that we haven't seen before, and that is outrageous. We're seeing, unfortunately, more and more of that as, as this market continues to be red hot. Tony, what is the implication of these facts you have laid out for recovery rates uh, at the bottom of the next cycle after a slew of inevitable bankruptcies come through? What will bondholders be recovering from their initial investments, given the weakness of these protective covenants? An excellent question, Jim. And unfortunately, it's one that's heavily dependent on the, on the specifics of the individual credit. All of that being said, this flexibility allows a company a lot more flexibility to kick the can down the road. And so if you're a senior secured lender or if you're in a, a high place in the capital structure, obviously, when things start to go really south, you want to be, have a seat at the table and be able to say, hey, this is it. Game over. Let's just file this. Or, 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 or and recover from the estate. The problem is when you have really loose permissive covenant structures, even in the most senior secured level of the capital structure, the company, if it chooses to, could try to delay the inevitable and kick the can down the road for the benefit of trying to see if they could extract some value for equity at the end of the day. And that's going to erode recoveries, generally speaking. Obviously, on a credit by credit basis, there are a lot more credit specific factors that come into play. Tony, uh, we're recording this on December 10th, and we just got a very disappointing initial unemployment claim data. 
Earlier in our call, you said that in uh, March and April, a lot of um, issuers were able to um, get uh, extensions, waivers on covenants in order to, you know, deal with the downturn and the shutdown of the economy. Did that just give borrowers flexibility to deal with the issues, or have we just kicked the can down the road, and do you expect more defaults next year? I think um, the w- most of the waivers took place on the lender side, so in leveraged loan credit agreements. Those waivers tend to expire in early to mid-2021, so early to mid-next year. And I think that if conditions don't improve for a lot of these lenders, you're going to see extensions of those. I think uh, one I think Scientific Games came to the market in October looking for a further extension from 2021 into 2022, and that was granted, and no additional uh, tightening of the covenants was needed because the waivers were actually fairly tight and tightened the covenants for the time being. But I think that you'll see more of the same. I think lenders are looking to give borrowers runway to execute the business and manage through a, a huge dislocation caused by the pandemic. And if we're still not back to normal in first quarter of 2021, when a lot of these waivers start expiring, I suspect you'll see more of the same in the way of extensions. One of the curious things about uh, this most unusual year in so many respects is that uh, you're seeing a lot of these so-called dividend recapitalizations transactions, meaning that uh, a private equity promoter you know, takes a, a company uh, out of the public market and recapitalize it, uh, adding a lot of debt proceeds of some of that borrowing, just removes the money from the enterprise and pays itself a big dividend just because it, uh, actually because it wants to. Now, you wouldn't suppose that, uh, uh, that uh, these dividend recaps would be a big thing during what Covenant Review very cleverly calls the great cessation, meaning that the recession superimposed upon the uh, uh, the federal or the state ordered uh, virtual cessation of commerce. But what do you make of the fact that so many of these dividend deals are happening? And is it a good thing for the economy? Is it a good thing even for the promoters who are withdrawing the money from their companies? Excellent question. We we do we have seen, especially in, in leveraged loans, a lot of dividend recap deals uh, over the summer, and those have particularly porous terms in them. For sponsors, sponsors would say, hey, this demonstrates the value proposition of what they bring to the table. They're able to show, they're able to get money out of the credit. It improves their investment, what their investment has returned. Um, but for the creditor who's in the credit and sees leverage packed on top of the credit, it's obviously a net negative because you're taking value out of the credit and the credit is becoming more levered as a result. Uh, unfortunately, it, you know, sponsors and the companies that are doing these transactions will say, this is what the market can bear. If we wanted to do a de- dividend recap and we came to the market and, and tried to do this new deal and the market threw up all over it, we wouldn't do it. So obviously the market is of the opinion that this is not a, too much leverage for the credit at the moment. So, you know, uh, Unfortunately, it's not a good thing for creditors in the market. It's not a good thing for long-term holders of credit in, in an issuer or borrower where you want to see cash in the, in the issuer and borrower reinvested into the business largely and delever over time. But that's the world we live in today, unfortunately. Well, speaking of the world that we live in, if you had a few minutes to um, sit down with the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Jerome Powell, and tell him about some of these shenanigans in the uh, fixed income market, w- would you um, give him an earful? I mean, in a respectful way, of course, but uh, would you have anything to say to the Fed about this? I would just make sure that the Fed is aware of the potential effects that the huge influx of liquidity has had on the system, which is that it it is making, uh, you know, it is contributing to what is a hot market. And, you know, there's some people in the market that say this is a great thing for the market. And there are others that say it's a terrible thing for the market. But I would just want to emphasize that that is, in fact, what is happening in the market, that you have a red hot market for investments in corporate bonds and term loan Bs and, and all of these types of instruments. Um, the other problem is, is that I wish people would understand that regulatory authorities are not likely to get involved here in contract disputes between lenders and borrowers, that they largely take the position that this is a matter between sophisticated parties with access to counsel. So the, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look to the Federal Reserve or the other regulatory authorities to kind of get involved. Speaking of... Um people in um, financial organizations that should know better. Last month, John Zito, who's the uh, deputy chief investment officer and co-head of uh, global credit at Apollo, um, says that the current wave of liquidity is just kind of clouding over the threats that are kind of in uh, the economy and especially in kind of the high yield companies that Apollo owns. Do you think that these dividend recaps and kind of these extremely loose terms are because private equity firms like Apollo have a lot of faith in their companies and they think they can bear the debt? Or do you think this is a cynical attempt to extract as much value as they can as quickly as they can while the getting is good? 
That's a good question. It's a loaded one, really tough to answer because the, the, the investors who are extracting the value are saying, look, we have no intention of sacrificing the rest of our equity and just trying to get what we can that's not nailed down before everything comes crashing down. That's, that's not their perspective. And if it were their perspective, there would be legal challenges to that. Uh, creditors would bring fraudulent conveyance actions. If, you were, if, you, if, it, if, it, if an issuer were to say, we're taking value off the table, even though it's going to leave this company in a precarious position and, and potentially a bankruptcy risk, there would be litigation over that. So I would think that the sponsors are more likely taking the position that this is a performing issuer. This is a performing borrower. They've done a good job. The market has a robust appetite for this kind of paper. And we're satisfying that appetite. And we're we're using that capital to make other investments. That's the position they would most likely take. And you've been... You- You've um, worked on both sides of the corporate leverage, both um, for private equity shops and for um, levered companies and also uh, on behest of investors. What's your take on the topic? My take on the topic is that it's, it's, it's a difficult one to sum up neatly because on the investor side, I do note the extraordinary demand for this type of paper, for these type of instruments. And in a lot of cases, I've talked to investors who said, we understand the risks. They are significant risk. It's part of the risks that we're willing to bear. So this part of me that says, that, I mean, this part of uh, when I, my reaction to that is these are informed investors that are generally making informed decisions and knowing that there are significant risks involved. On the other hand, this part of me that says, I wonder the extent to which these investors really know how porous these documents are. And a lot of times these lessons about how porous the documents are aren't really fully known until they've learned firsthand. So right, a word right, right. exchange offer, assets are removed from the credit when things get bad, up tiering exchanges, all of these sorts of things tend to teach people a lot more about what could happen than a report that I would write at the beginning. Yeah, some things you can't uh, understand in words alone. <laughs> you need, you need uh, the visceral sensations. Unfortunately, those who suffer most finally are not the professional investors, but the people whose money the professional investors invest. But enough of that lamentation. I want to thank uh, Tony Canelli, who is beyond an authority on the fine print in loan documents, um, one of the voices uh, for equity, fair dealing, and um, and you know uh, common sense too on Wall Street. So Tony, thank you for being with us. If, with Covenant Review, let us not forget display the merchandise. I'm going to hold up a copy of Covenant Review to the microphone, and I expect everyone can see it. And uh, if the spirit moves, subscribe to it. Tony, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, Anthony P. Canale, ladies and gentlemen, the global head of research at Covenant Review, a voice of reason, common sense, and equity on Wall Street. And, uh, and Evan, uh, good to talk to you as well. And uh, Evan, the next time you take a train in from Brooklyn, just uh, look to your left and look to your right, and just, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to see. <laughs> Will do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Uh, this is Jim Grant again on behalf of Current Yield, and we will talk to you again soon. Mm-hmm.